Hey everybody, welcome to another Film Music Media Conversation. My name is Kai Savas and I'm here with the amazing Jeff Rona. Jeff, it's so good to see you again. It's been too long. Thank you so much for uh, for joining me again. Kaya, it is always a pleasure to see you. Uh, here we are on opposite coasts and uh, it's good to see your face. Absolutely, you too. So uh, for anyone listening, watching, uh, Jeff and I have done you know some talks in the past and definitely go back and check that. We looked at his career and, and some of his projects like White Squall and all these different things. But um, for, this, for this chat, uh, <clears throat> I want to jump right into it because you in the year 2000 wrote an amazing book called The Real World. And it is an amazing tool for for media composers who are looking to get a kind of a sense of the industry and a sense of what it takes to to survive in this and to to make it a living. And uh, you just recently, you know, it's been you recently updated it because it, our industry is always changing. So always um, changing, always changing. So you have a brand new edition out, and uh, which is fantastic. So yeah, I, I guess to to start off. Maybe let's just go back to the origins of when you wrote the book initially and what made you want to, I guess, write that book first off. Damn good, damn good question there, Kaya. Yeah. I ask myself that question frequently. And <laughs> um, so when I was when I was just getting started, I was a synth programmer uh for a bunch of other composers. So I mean I started off in the record business programming for Earth, Wind, and Fire and working with RB artists and working with um all kind all a lot of a-list uh, record producers and that was kind of my initial uh place in 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 music and then doing my own kind of weird weird avant-garde stuff on the side that i yeah. never intended would be uh, ever make the light of day <laughs> um but eventually eventually all of my clients as a synth programmer drum programmer were um were film composers specifically and this is this is kind of when technology had really started to rise up in film and television yeah the especially the economics of television it it became and you know not to date myself but you know when i got to lose um late 80s into early 90s um the explosion in electronic music left a lot of very established composers behind yeah um, they weren't they weren't picking up on this new this new thing of investing in electronic instruments in computers. They were paper and pencil guys who were still doing live sessions here in Los Angeles. <clears throat> so, you know, I'd been involved in the in the development of MIDI, and so I already had a, a foothold in the music technology world. I worked for Roland for a few years, and and did some development there. And, built their first helped them design their first sampler from a composer's perspective anyway so i have all of this experience and along the way i meet um the editor of keyboard magazine at the time the leading music technology magazine and he yeah. said hey i like all this stuff you're doing why don't you write about it and so very quickly what that became was me writing about sessions that i had, i was doing for other composers but then i had kind of my moment to make a pivot in my own career as a ghostwriter and as a ghostwriter i'm working on all these projects so i wrote these magazine columns for for years and they collated it into a book so it came out in 2000 or 2001 and um 2000 and um it was just a collection of articles but here's the thing about it is they were all written from the perspective of the naive composer it was me making stupid blunders, figuring out what I did wrong, making a, making jokes about it, and then talking about what really would, what, what solved the problem. And so that's, that's what the original book was. It was the beginner's mind, it was the naive voice. And that book got updated in 2010, mostly just to, to update the fact that technology had completely changed. Yeah. So yeah. the second edition of the book was, was relatively modest. Um, a couple more interviews, <clears throat> excuse the cough, and um, and so uh, that 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 was that. Now two thousand and and twenty rolls around, and my book got sold to a new publisher, and they reached out to me, 
in uh, 2021. And they said, this book has done very, very well. This is one of the most successful books on, on film music that, that we've ever put out. Yeah. Um, would you be interested in doing a new edition? And gave it a lot of thought and I realized that I can't speak from the naive perspective anymore. You know, mm -hmm. I've been doing it now for the better part of almost 30 years. Yeah. So I decided to rewrite the book um, from more from the perspective, less from the perspective of I did this and this is what happened to here is this world. I live in this world. This is a world you're interested in. Let's talk about this world together. And let's specifically talk about how this world, how you apply to this world. What is your significance in this world? And what is this, what does it mean to want to be a composer for media? And what does it mean to, what does it mean to want it? What does yeah. it mean to feel you have a place in it? And then more specifically, I had not been scoring video games prior to 2010, with a couple of little exceptions. I did a, God, I did a, Michael Giacchino and I did the Lion King video game yeah. on console. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was one of then, his first credits. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then nothing for years. I did a little uh, Transformers thing. But then after 2010, I became very established in video game scoring. So I wrote an entire new section to to the book on the aesthetics and and the the workflow of video games because when i started in video games i thought it was kind of the same as scoring film until somebody pointed out that i was doing it wrong and th that i was leaving a lot on the table we, we can we can jump into that yeah but that's kind of the the history of the book um you know starting off as kind of a lark and then progressing into something that i think that has a lot more relevance and a lot more gravity to to composers interested in figuring out their place in the world. Yeah, was it a challenge? You know, and you've you've been in this industry for such a long time, and you've uh, you know you've established your career, and you've seen the world change around you. And uh, I'm I, I'm not I'm saying this because I've seen this online where you know. There's a lot of groups, Facebook groups and forums where, you know, yeah. you have this mixture of like veteran composers and young composers. And sometimes you can sense that that the advice that the the older, you know, composers give might be a little out of touch or like not in, yeah. you know, with what younger composers are experiencing these days. Was it a challenge for you to make sure that you wanted to make sure this book was in touch with the the, the problems that they are facing that were completely different than the challenges and problems that you were facing when you when you were starting out? Absolutely. I, I actually asked several young composers to read the book for me. Mm. So I got a lot of feedback from some composers, from some, um, I had a couple of uh, university professors who teach music for media read it. Yeah. Um, I started following a bunch of the forums on Facebook uh, and Twitter and reading comments and questions. And I really got the thirst and the hunger for knowledge. Um, am I out of touch? I don't know. I, I don't think so because, you know, I've always surrounded myself with young composers. I've yes, had yeah. assistants, I've had interns, and now I have an entire company ba built around um, video games. And we have about eight or nine employees, several of whom are young composers. Some are not that young. And so, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think I might be deluded. I did have a situation where I was uh, part of a of a, a Facebook group, and somebody asked about how important social media was in the life of an aspiring composer, and I th and the question kind of reflected whether or not you could actually land work with Instagram or TikTok, mm -hmm. and I I posted well. I don't personally know of anybody who's ever gotten a job, gotten a job because of something they posted on their social media. And I, I got I got quite the smackdown on that one um, because <laughs> several people had said, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I connected with a director and I got a short film from it. So uh, I, I knew composers who had found work through YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I know a composer who had posted some of their trailer music and got a massive A-list movie uh, as a result of having posted a, a, you know, 
a trailer with kind of epic orchestral hybrid orchestral electronic big drum things and they got a massive film oddly that that their career never progressed past that yeah um, so i won't get into it but uh but so I, I, don't yeah, know. I mean I, that happens I, I think michael abels is probably the best example because jordan peele was on youtube watching some of his his concert work and that's how yeah he, he got pulled so, in to get out yeah that happens you know outside of that am i out of touch i don't know um i acknowledge that getting a start in the business is very different now than yeah uh when i did it when my peers did it um you know i i i still have a strong belief in mentorship which i yeah. think has become uh less interesting to a lot of young composers especially the concept of an unpaid internship is right has become pretty uh pretty pretty no way no you know thanks but no thanks right and i, I acknowledge that <clears throat> you know um a young composer who's reviewed the book uh for the scl um actually he said jeff i wrote you a really good review except for one thing you mentioned unpaid internships and i had to take deep exception that that's acceptable <clears throat> so um actually i haven't done an unpaid internship in many many years it used to be pretty normal actually in the state of california it's become uh illegal unless it's for school credit right yeah it has to be for school credit yeah and that's actually been the case for a, a good while so i haven't been you know skirting that that particular uh law um yeah so you know I, I think the the path to getting into the business is a little different i don't think the business itself is substantially different in terms of what is expected of a composer whether they're scoring a web series or a or a feature film or video game you know i don't think the expectations are different uh, i don't think the workflow is substantially different mm. i'm working on a small film right now with a very young team of producers um you know they, they use a little bit different language but what we're doing is essentially the same thing of finding the soul of a score um talking about it what the language you know what is the conversation like um so uh no i i think some things have changed but for the most part we're dealing in the same world we're we're telling stories with music yeah. We're expected to be consummate uh, storytellers and consummate producers. The economics of having a great studio keeps getting easier and better. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I'm curious because you, you mentioned uh, how you had to get the first edition of the book. You kind of wrote it from that naive point of view and kind of reexamining what you did wrong, what are mistakes you did. Was that... Um, to, was that hard, I guess, to just to be vulnerable with yourself and be like, yeah, I really, you know, you know, I really messed up over here. And this is something that I wouldn't, I want to <laughs> share with the world. <laughs> no, you know, um, I, I, I kept the horror stories to myself. I'm sure. Yeah, um, the... <laughs> but, you know, I have gotten countless emails over the years saying how much people appreciated a book written in the first person. Mm. I was asked to do this. This is how I did it. I, I was told not to do that again. I was asked to do it differently. I learned my lesson. I'll never do it again onward. So I got a, I've gotten so much positive feedback that people re felt the book was really relatable mm -hmm. because it was written in the first person and it was all based on anecdotes. The second edition wasn't much different. The third edition isn't written in the first person. I've completely eliminated, 95% eliminated the I, unless it's something truly opinionated. But right. the book is actually written in the second person. The book is about you. And in that regards, this is me saying all the things I wish somebody had said to me at the beginning of my career. You know, there's so much. And you know this better than pretty much anybody on the planet. The politics, psychology. Yeah the the um the level the high level of communication skills how one talks about music to a non-musician how one deals with the myriad of personalities um you know 
I think along the way, I, I, I made massive errors early in my career, which it took me years to co correct. And a lot of it had to do with what it means to build relationships. Right, right. You know, in a pre-COVID world, so look, in, in, in the last, I don't know, five years, certainly since COVID and a little bit before, 95% of my meetings have been on Zoom calls. Yeah. You know, most of the video games I've done, and, and frankly, the films, none of them have been produced in LA. All of my spotting sessions, all of my playbacks, all of my conversations have been electronic. You know, and, and so it's, it's a different, it's a different way of relating to people. And I personally think it makes it that much easier when your relationship is electronic. It seems to me that it makes it a little easier to kind of just move on. And that may be true both for producers and directors, as well as composers. You know, a lot of the people that I, I work with by being in the room with them are people who I socialize with. Right. And it's, yeah. it's important to me. And I think it's important for any composer to remember that people love to work with people they love to work with. Yeah. And, I mean, I, yeah. And, and you can never underplay the value of personal relationships. You know, James Newton Howard plays a lot of tennis with a lot of A-list producers and directors, you know? Yeah. Uh, Marty Davidge plays golf with an astonishing array of people. Um, Hans invites his directors over for dinner, you know, like, you know, dining with Gore or Ridley, you know. <laughs> and I do the same, you know. I, I just bought a pizza oven and I've learned how to make dough from scratch to have to have my well, but these are beloved people in my life. Right. Yeah. They're... You know, I love to cook for friends and I love to be close to the people with whom I have had these kind of combat field experiences with. Yeah, it's a unique profession so... because it's it's not just like an office job. You know where you check out at five o'clock and you live your life you come back and it's but it and since you get we're all telling stories which are pulled from life and just the human condition it's just like it becomes the shared blur of like living life working and telling stories and being able to make a living doing that which is very you know very privileged and fortunate because it is a but it is so much work you know you're in the trenches and these are just to get anything made if you see a finished video game a finished tv series or a finished film it's a miracle that that got made, you know? <laughs> you know, I've always thought the exact same thing, that it's a miracle that any movie gets made, let alone good ones. Yes, yeah. The opportunity to ruin and, and spoil good work is so insanely high. Yeah. And the same is true with TV, same is true with video games. Um, games actually, I think, are, are the least susceptible to that lowest common denominator that often finds its way into um, the last two months of a project. Right, yeah, absolutely. So um, you, uh, you you mentioned also earlier how when you started writing the book, there was a lot of kind of the, the older generation that kind of got left behind as technology changed. So I'm curious from your perspective, as your career, as you went through, how important was it for you to be on top of the newest technology learn it uh and how did you teach yourself when the when new program came out or a new DAW or new system or anything and uh how integral is that i guess today as things seem to be just rapidly changing uh, all, yeah. all the time well you know if you look at the fact that um so i guess we're living in what is referred to as peak television yeah. where the just the uh, sheer volume of output and the and the breadth of it is unparalleled. Same is somewhat true in, in, in film. Um, I think we're starting to see the, all of that wane, but we've just experienced over the last uh, less than a decade, an explosion in incredible filmmaking and incredible TV making. <clears throat> and along with that, I think has been this amazing willingness to be quite experimental musically. And I think it's birthed an entire generation of composers whose work would have been viewed as unworthy. Mm, yeah. You know, you look at the score to Chernobyl as a really basic, simple example of, of a score that nobody would have signed off on right. uh, before. But, but 
now that we have young, you know, a generation of young storytellers wanting to tell stories in a unique way, part of that is the fact that we now have these amazing new uh, voices musically, you know, and Johan Johansson was another great example, you know, the, the score to Arrival, where he's taking orchestras and, you know, putting them on, on, on tape and then slowing the tape down and coming up with amazing textures. Um, and, and, and it's, it's become wonderful. And, you know, it's wonderful because my whole background has been in avant-garde music and in electronic music and in ambient music. Yes. <clears throat> and, and so I've pined to have more opportunities to do the kind of music that I consider to be really personal and yet still work within um, the, the needs of, of media, you know? And That's so I, I think it's actually, been, no, there hasn't been a better time for composers who have the ability to work with unique technology, to, to create ambient music, to, to blend different approaches to, to music, and at the same time, retain that sense of cinema, storytelling, of visuals. So a little bit of that kind of still runs old school in a way. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, we're still telling, I mean, music still, is perceived by people in the same way. You know, we haven't changed. Right. Um, so how particular harmonies, particular sounds, particular instruments, particular rhythms affect us emotionally, not substantially different. The human, you know, the nervous system isn't substantially different. But I think we're we're more willing to accept things that, you know, you don't, nobody stops and goes, what the hell was that noise? You know, what was that cool, weird, bassy, swirling noise? We don't, you don't know, who cares? It doesn't matter. How we get there is, you know, become, again, the technology on a laptop of what you can do sonically and compositionally is remarkable. Absolutely incredible. I mean, compared to, yeah, I mean, what you what was available at the time when you started your career versus now and the same thing with me i always joke even though i'm you know uh i'm only 30 i'm turning 36 this year i was the last class in my film school to use 16 millimeter film and yeah, yeah. They, they they literally just changed everything to digital like i remember people were talking about you know dslr is like oh this is the, the new way and everything you don't have to you know ingest and, and log footage anymore you just stick this the sd card in we're like what like well, you know it just yeah. really changed and it changes and you and it, it's crazy how everyone now has a camera in their pocket speaking outside of film music i mean just they're everyone's a filmmaker everyone who uses social media is telling short form stories is learning composition is learning you know working with the lens and telling a story and i think it's very it might my the argument might be it's like everything is oversaturated and the competition is crazy but i think to hear all these unique voices i think it's just the opportunity is there for 100%. anyone you can 100%. never say oh yeah i tried like you you have no excuse not to do it because it's yeah. literally something you can do in your pocket <laughs> You know, my very, very first television show that I scored as a, as a solo composer was a show called Homicide Life on the Street that Barry yeah. Levinson produced. <clears throat> and it begat The Wire and Treme and, and it, it begat a whole new generation of, of film, of television making that was gritty and it was handheld and it was documentary style. And I'd worked with Hans Zimmer on a Barry Levinson movie called Toys yeah. uh, with Robin Williams. And um, I did some weird, weird cues that were just sounds. And um, Barry really liked that. And so he was doing his very first foray into TV. And his first idea was this show should have no music so that it feels more like a documentary. He tried it and it didn't work. <clears throat> and Hans and I met with him and we said, well, let's just try an experiment. So I went off and I sampled police car, police radios, and all of these sounds. And I slowed them and I warped them and I stretched them and I did all this stuff. And that score, which I did for two of the four seasons the show ran, the show moved to New York. And this was before high-speed internet. 
So um, I created what I think is the first ambient electronic score for a major network television series. And Barry was very happy. The network never figured out what the hell was going on. (laughs) Over time, they pushed me to be a little more musical. So I, Barry Levinson is a huge blues fan. So I actually added just this kind of almost ambient blues guitar. Um, And, you know, other scores I've done, I've had the opportunity to be bold and electronic, but not nearly to the extent that I wish. And yeah. actually on some of my video game projects, I'm getting to be a lot weirder and and have a little more fun with it. But um, on on um, it, it comes up again and again. And yeah, so I, do, I really feel like being on your A game with technology and what the technology offers us as musicians and storytellers. It's, you know, it's never about technology for technology's sake. You know, one thing that's been ingrained for a long time now is that there's no longer an excuse for a mediocre sounding demo. Yeah. Whether you're writing a symphonic score or a a rock score, a hip hop score, an EDM score, or some hybrid score, an ambient score. um, And but especially if you're writing for orchestra, the excuse for, well, it'll sound better with the with the orchestra. Nobody wants to hear about it. And so it has become really important for composers to be really on their on on the mark for what sample libraries to work with but having a good sample library isn't the same as making it sound good yeah um a not somebody who doesn't know what they're doing can have whatever the best libraries in the world and that's exactly. arguable yeah um if you don't know how loud a clarinet is against a cello and viola section playing at forte it's going to sound weird yeah. you 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 it's it's a it's the poker tell it's mixing incorrectly and and not getting your ambiences right not getting your mic positions right <clears throat> but the sample libraries have gotten so much better anyway that's my take on it yeah you have to be incredible because you know this um we're not paid to write the music as much as we're paid to produce the music yeah no, absolutely. And I, and, and I love how you mentioned, I mean, it's so cool that you got to go sample things too for Homicide because you mentioned also, you know, Hildur's score to um, Chernobyl where she went mm-hmm. and sampled metallic sounds and creating yeah. textures. And and that's not a, you know, that's not a unique thing to, to either of you because so many composers do that now where you go out and sample the world around you and kind of create these, these textures. And it's, it creates and I, I know there was a big moment when social network won the oscar you know for best score because i don't think anyone was expecting kind of an ambient textural score like that to win and <clears throat> it's very and true you, i yeah. it was very telling um that that score and a few subsequent uh trent reznor atticus ross scores have gotten mainstream notice yeah. writing outside of the the box you know outside of the mainstream you know a couple of years before chernobyl i did a, a small film with ed harris <clears throat> called Phantom. It was a it, it was about a Soviet submarine. Yeah, that's the right. whole movie takes place on a submarine. And I went and I sampled a submarine. Um, there's a maritime museum in San Diego, and they filmed the movie inside that a 1950s diesel powered Soviet submarine that was there. And so during a lunch break, I was given one hour to go in with a field recorder and some mallets and rubber mallets and record actually phrases and then uh, time stretch them and beat match them and get them so that they may turn them into loops and yeah. virtually the entire score is based almost the entire score is based on that and a little bit of a Balkan choir wow that's see that that aspect of it is so fascinating because yeah create it's it's almost like you're if, if you want to compare it to the director or the you know cinematographer, you're going at your you're getting the tools you need, bring it back to the editing bay, and you're you're getting the the ingredients for your stew, and then you get to <clears throat> massage it and create new things and and come up with awesome things. And I think that's the most fascinating part of the process for me because that's yeah. something, you know, people talk about AI music and everyone's scared about all of that, but it's and it's definitely worth talking about, but um, because of you know just the economic side of it of, of where companies might go, but you're not yeah. going to take that human aspect or to go and create something like that and create that textural thing and feel what it makes you feel. And you know, we talked about the psychology of music and 
psychology of filmmaking and how it you know lands on the audience and i think there's no replacement for that but um but yeah i mean what is your take on ai music I'm talking about the future maybe like you know what is your what is what is the future of of you know you you kind of update the book every ten years it seems I'm curious if, <laughs> I'm curious oh, if you just, are you just to be ahead? clear this is the third and final edition I am never, <laughs> never I am never going to do this again anything I'm ever going to have to say I was able to squeeze in in into this uh, edition I think um, do you ever think about the future though or do you just kind of, of course assess it assess it as it comes along well I think. You have to divide the conversation. You have to bifurcate it into two conversations. Yeah. Assistive AI and generative AI. So on the assistive side, it's already been here for a while. Right. Um, and there's just a, we're going to see an explosion in smart drum machines and smart EQs. There's already smart uh, uh, plugins that uh, learn from what you do and compare what you do to other recordings and analyze and and help create a better sound so there's already ai you know uh, i was talking to some of the people at apple about you know their daw logic <clears throat> and and very casually said oh logic's had machine learning for years we just don't talk about it yeah which means that by using logic you're improving logic <clears throat> and and we're, we're you know ai is turning into a bit of a buzzword yeah, uh, I think yeah. it's getting abused a little bit. You yeah. know, there's AI, there's machine learning, there's algorithmic, and there's intelligent. They aren't the same thing. They get confused. So, I mean, I love, you know, I, I used to program uh, scores using Max MSP. So, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, if you work in modular synthesis, which I do, and in a way programming in in Max and other object-oriented programming languages, you're not creating a composition in the traditional sense. You're building, you're building an algorithmic, you're building an algorithmic instrument, and then you're playing the instrument. And that becomes the comp the composition. So I'm very used to that. I've done that from before anybody, you know, working with programming languages that can improvise. I've taught computers to improvise since before MIDI. And um and I've used it on film scores uh, on a number of occasions. I don't talk about it, but you create something and then you, it, it becomes a challenge. It's like, a, it's like unlocking a puzzle box that you've created yourself. <clears throat> so that concept of assistive AI, where you may not be invent coming up with the actual notes, but you are interacting with an environment that you've created or that has been created for you. Right. Um, I don't have an issue with that. I've been, I've been doing it. A bunch of other people are doing it. I think we're going to see an explosion in assistive tools, you know, an arpeggiator can come up with, you know, has random modes. Yeah. There's all kinds of randomness built into DAWs and into plugins where <clears throat> drum parts, bass, I mean, any, anything you can think of has randomizable elements and, and people use them all the time. Yeah. So that's that's assistive AI. I think we're at the cutting, you know, the cusp of some pretty cool stuff. The question is, is what about those tools in which you truly abdicate the role of composer at all? Right. And one of the things I'll say from our uh, late April 2023 perspective <laughs> is there's a lot of people, there are a lot of companies working on generative AI. It's, it's already finding its way into Spotify and music streaming platforms. <clears throat> Comple you know, it's already finding its way into user generated content on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. And there are companies that are really raising money to develop generative AI. And what's interesting about those companies and those research endeavors, Google has a, a, a music AI platform. Everybody has a music AI. Uh, I, I had a conversation just a month ago with one of the head uh, people at Meta about all of their musical uh, AI initiatives. And it is massive at a scale that, frankly, was quite upsetting. Wow. Um, nobody ever talks about generative music AI from the perspective of better music. Yeah, they talk about it. 
it's different than the argument being made for generative AI for graphics, images, photography, uh, video, uh, motion graphics, uh, coding, um, marketing, language, newsletter. I mean, there's a huge swath of endeavors where people are saying, well, AI can do this better. And you can work with the AI to improve it, even though it's going to write your your next ad, it's going to write your next whatever. Nobody, I've never personally heard anybody say, we're working on an algorithm that will write music better than any songwriter or composer today. Mm-hmm. What yeah. they're talking about instead is cutting out the pesky middleman. Yeah. Music without a composer, potentially without a publisher, means a different financial model. And I consider that to be incredibly sarcastic. I'm sorry, cynical. Yeah. And um, and it's a money grab at this point in time. That may change, but that is my observation. Here's here's the issue. You know, you probably read uh, early uh, within the last year, um, Getty Images, which is the stock pho- photography company, right. sued one of the AI companies for scraping all of the data yep, from yep. their catalog. Because with a, ca- a, a stock photography catalog, you have an image and then you have te- uh, keywords, you have metadata. And that's what AI does is it pairs it together. So they sued them saying, you, we never gave you permission to put our photographers out of business. Right, um, yeah. And this is happening wholesale. Um, it's happening in music as well. You, the way, it, you know, generative AI or, you know, the AI in its current incarnation is based on a learning model. You give it thousands or millions of examples. It analyzes it, it builds threads, it builds a web between those, right? Yep. And it, yep. it creates, it synthesizes new language based on what it's learned. You can't have generative AI without taking ideas from existing composers. And no composer I know has said, go for it. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah, that that big boom that we just saw with the the face, the face thing where it created everyone's little uh, avatars and everyone did it. And that was like, and that kind of reawakened, like, oh yeah. And then you realize it's taking stuff yeah. from everyone well, artists from everyone around to create that art, a, you know? absolutely and you know i'm separate i'm going to make a distinction between the sort of the deep fake vocal ai that that you know there's there's now an m&m like a flawless yeah. m&m Char- that you Roller, put into your yeah. music there's the drake and weekend songs and everybody's been posting these songs right jay-z I'm jay-z talking about too, yeah, yeah. you know there are currently several ai engines where you can say i have a scene and I need a piece of music and I need it to be a minute and 45 seconds. And I need it to be slow and beautiful with a peak at around a minute and 10 seconds and then come down. There are apps that do that. And it is generating music absolutely from scratch. And if you don't like it, you can say, oh, do it again, do it again, do it. Oh, I like this one. And then you can download it for a few dollars. That is a, a situation of of generative AI, that's just an economic, just, it's just, it's cheap money, it's cheap yeah. music. And um, obviously it lacks any real interaction between a filmmaker or content creator and a musical content creator to say, I wish that the melody kind of ascended a little bit. Right now they don't do that. I'm sure they will eventually. Um, you know, is it soulful? It, it's better than it was a couple of years ago. Yeah. There's, you know, Kaya, I'm a member of the SCL. I'm a member of some other composer collectives. And it, it, the conversation is, in, is absolutely, it just, it's, it's unending. Um, you know, if you look back at technology and you look at samplers and drum machines, did anybody get put out of business from samplers and drum machines? The answer is yeah, a lot of people. Yeah. Mostly the mediocre ones. You know, if you weren't yeah. if you if you weren't great, you were replaceable. Um, 
obviously, as sampling's gotten better, there's been less work for orchestras. You know, the, the orchestral musicians, especially in Los Angeles, have really suffered yeah. <clears throat> from the fact that filmmaking, you know, uh, production companies, they get it. They can't hear the difference. Yeah. In many cases, except for the good ones. Again, the good ones go, yeah, I get it. This is the MIDI demo. It sounds great. I love the music. I love, I love the theme, this theme and that theme. Now let's go out and record it. If you take real pride in your work, you don't go for the cheapest uh, option. Um, I think that generative AI will probably start to replace some people. And again, I think if you are not, if you don't bring something of true value as a human being, then maybe maybe you are at times replaceable. Yeah. Uh, I will say there is a catch. And the catch has to do with if AI music is generally built upon learning, you know, scrape listening to music, listening to vocalists, and creating original, what seems like original material, it's uncopyrightable. Uh, in fact, just recently, the US Copyright Office has made it very clear that you cannot copyright the work of a machine. Mm. So as a composer, I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of projects in my career. Right. With every single one, I've had to sign a legal document in which I take responsibility for the originality of that music, <clears throat> which says not only are the, it, are the notes mine, but so are the samples and the sounds and the vocals and everything. I had permission. I didn't steal anything. And if I did, I indemnify the studio, the production company, everybody. It's called a certificate of authorship. Every composer signs one on every project, no exceptions. So an AI can't do that. It is actually not part of the US Copyright Office yeah. to say, um, I will allow the producers of a project to copyright the score to this project that was generated that was created by generative AI. And the fact is, is I think we haven't seen the first major lawsuit, but it, yeah. it's coming. Plagiarism, not that yeah. Drake or Weekend, The Weekend, or Eminem, who have all spoken out to say, "Do not fucking steal my voice." Yeah. Um, except for Grimes. She said any, she'll split 50-50 with anybody who generates uh, her voice, she'll split it with them, which is, I guess, generous. I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> so, I, I, I mean, yeah, absolutely, we're going to see a shift in the world. And I think like a lot of things in technology, some of it for the better, some of it for the worse, some of it very shallow, and some of it excruciatingly beautiful. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean let's face it, yeah. there are some stunningly beautiful scores done entirely inside of technology. Yeah. And, I mean. and, you know, getting back to young composers with an interest in a start, being able to create truly evocative, beautiful, interesting new sonic worlds is, is part and parcel, which isn't to say you can't continue to want to and to write uh, orchestral and more traditional music, yeah. but it's 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 a narrow narrower path than it ever used to be. Yeah, I, I, I for me the biggest yeah you mentioned a lot. I mean you, you that was so eloquently put together and so well well spoken. I mean that. And I'm I'm learning a lot too. Just, I'm not thinking about all these <laughs> different things too. Like because I, yeah, I just hear it on the surface level, and you see, yeah, AI is kind of this kind of buzzword now. But um, you know, just for me working in the industry and seeing how everything has really just shifted to, especially recently within the past year or two after the pandemic, where you see these mergers happening, uh, yeah. a lot of uh, scaling back down because of the streaming bubble popping, and that's yeah, that's a worry for me. It's like. It looks like these corporations are looking for the, the best way to cut costs, cut residuals, cut, um, you know, keep cash flow coming in and make sure the stock prices are up. And yeah, I think that's that's, <laughs> that's the dangerous part where it's like, oh, there's an easier, cheaper way to do it. And 90 sure. percent of the population might not notice, you know, or, you know. Yeah. Well, you so. know, even within even within a massive 
platform like Netflix. And this is true with HBO or Amazon or now Apple is they don't function monolithically. They are functioning as, you know, inside of uh, these companies, there are multiple production wings at yeah. different at different tiers. Right. And so the tiers uh, within each one have a particular um, uh, economy. Yeah. So, you know, all of these platforms have their a their a list productions where they will hire an a list composer, record an a list orchestra, sign union contracts, work with you know SAG singers, and then below that is mid tier and low tier, and you know it's based on uh, the diversity of viewership and their their willingness to account for what you know what is considered profitable when you don't have a metric like box office right you know but they know how many people watch so you know i've worked on big medium and small projects with a number of 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 streamers and so you know they they almost don't resemble each other you know different teams different music heads um and different expectations so you know uh I've done a couple of projects at Netflix. I have one that came out last year, one that's going to come out at the end of this year. And they love having an orchestra, although they they asked me to record in Europe. Yeah, um, that's for for ec economic reasons, for union reasons. It's just just how they how they work. Um, but I've worked on other projects that you know, in the box was fine. Yeah. So um, I, I I think again it gets down to diversity. Um, there is such a fa an interest in the diversity of projects, the diversity of the audience, the fact that the, one of the reasons we've seen such an explosion in production is wanting to cater to a broader range of of viewership. Right. Who say, well, you know, that sitcom isn't funny to me, but one like this would be. Yeah. As a result, we've seen an enormous interest in. Uh, a diversity in composers and to that end not only are content creators which i'm using as sort of the overarching term for film tv and video game creators yeah <clears throat> um you know but an interest in working with less traditional um less traditional composers composers with different backgrounds musically yeah um, composers with different backgrounds period so you know the interested the interest in working with composers from underserved uh, groups has become uh, a major, major thing, especially again, since COVID. And I don't know that it's related, <clears throat> but for the past several years, there's just been a greater willingness to work with first time composers who come from unique backgrounds. Right. Um, and I think it's fabulous, you know, yeah, I've seen composers who really would not have been given the opportunities. Um, and, you know, not to say that it's, you know, not to pander to diversity hiring, which is is not a cool thing. Yeah. You know, the composers that I see getting work are deserving of work. Yes. It happens to be that they come from from less representative groups, less represented groups and are getting opportunities that they probably wouldn't have gotten from the old guard and i appreciate that i applaud that um i got asked to score a film just now and i felt i didn't want to do it alone that i it you know it, it's an african-american director with an african-american cast about a it's a true story um about a about an african-american girl and her difficulties and <clears throat> i've been working with this phenomenal these two brothers we have this, uh, they're, they're jazz musicians um, for this band called uh, Black Nile. Mm -hmm. We're on the same label. We work on the same rec for the same record label. My 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 solo work goes out on Alpha Pup. They're an Alpha Pup. The head of the label says you got to meet these guys. So I meet these two young brothers. They're both in their twenties. They're both here in L.A. Wow. Uh, and they're, they, they do kind of experimental jazz. And then I find out, well, one studied film music at USC, and the other <laughs> one studied at uh, the at Berkeley College. Wow. So in fact, these two guys are built to be scoring films, but nobody would ever show them the time of day. Yeah. So I did. So I recommended them, and so I'm just I'm just producing the score. 
That's awesome. That's yeah. So, and I'm I'm not saying that to pat my to pat myself. Oh no, yeah, not at all. Yeah. Um, I actually had to sell the idea that it was not an easy sell. Um, they wanted me to do it. There was a reason they wanted me to do it. There was a, yeah. something I'd written that they really liked. And they said, this is what exactly what we're thinking. I said, I think these guys can do it and do it, do it better than me. And, you know, knock wood so far, so good. You know, we're yeah. ask me again on May 12th when we have to turn the score in. <laughs> um, so I, I love, I love this, you know, it certainly means that, you know, dinos, certain dinosaurs like myself, you know, middle-aged cis white men um, are, are going to have have it a little less easy. Yeah. And I'm okay with that too. If there's only so much to go around, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I really am. Um, my career is doing, is, I'm, I'm doing okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. I still, I plan to do it for a lot longer. I love what I do. I'm exploring a lot of new territories, especially in uh, video game work, but I, I haven't begun to do what I've set, what I've set out to do. Um, and part of that involves doing some collaborations that are, un, you know, unexpected. So, you know, again, kind of hearkening back to what is a, you know, what is it, uh, what is the market for a, a young composer? Yeah, I, I'd go so far as to say it's never been better and it's never been worse. It's never been better because of the interest in young and new vo in new voices, and it's never been worse in the fact that the uh, uh, competition out there is phenomenally fierce yeah there's so many people uh trying to explore this as an option and you know if you go onto the facebook groups and the instagram groups they're massive they're in the thousands or tens of thousands yeah you know how do how do you get how do you get noticed you know when i was coming up it was far easier but yeah. you know again i came i came up through mentorship i had uh a few i had two composers speak up for me and recommend me mark isham and hans zimmer yeah and their voices were loud and i wouldn't have had a career if it wasn't for them saying i can't do this job but i think i know just the right guy right and that led uh to a lot you know my my time co-writing with them and writing for them and ghostwriting and 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 collaborating that was that was just school that was my yeah. college for them to say you know i don't have time to do this job but it's a good job give it to jeff that was that's the only experience i personally have with how you get uh, a leg up but as i've learned from uh, you know a, a a wide swath of young composers there really are you know you have to admit, and I'm sure, I, I'm sure you've asked hundreds of times, how did you get your start? Uh, I, I usually, if it, was, if it was the first time we're talking, I always start and, yeah, and, the first and, question. And, and has, have you ever gotten the same answer twice? Never. That's why I always ask it. It's <sighs> never the same answer. And everyone always, you know, how do I do this? How do I get there? And it is, it is helpful to see the paths other people take, but it, everyone's background is so unique and it's usually... You know, it's a mix of luck, a mix of talent, a mix of being at the right place at the right time, a mix of, you know, creating opportunities for yourself, or some people start late in life, some people knew they want to do it when they were five years old, it's just, <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, uh, it's crazy, you know. You yeah. Know, so, <clears throat> yeah, well, <laughs> obviously, uh, be a rock star turns, you know, opens a few doors, doesn't it? Yeah, and yeah. it certainly didn't hurt. You know anybody from Danny Elfman and, and Trent Reznor? It's actually a pretty substantial list of yeah. composers who don't even read or write music per se, right? right. Um, who only got their start because they were already well known doing something else. Yeah. Now you have the same thing happening in electronic music, you know, with Hacks and Cloak and M83 and and uh, Rob Simonson and. A whole a host of people, um, you know, Onatrix Point Never, who you know, yeah. you know, Eamon Tobin, um, who are scoring fairly good films because they were doing cool, weird ambient music, but being successful at it. Yeah. Um, jazz, much less so. You know, uh, actually, part of working on the book, I was trying to think, 
how many jazz musicians have had substantial careers in oh yeah you asked remember you asked i think you, you were one of them weren't yeah, you yeah you asked me i remember it. you messaged me you texted me you're like hey, hey do you know and i was yeah trying to rack my brain of like actual <clears> like <throat> other than mark i can't you know i was like you know yeah well terrence <laughs> blanchard oh Ter yeah well, i think i mentioned terrence yeah yeah there were you know, a few oddly but, enough yeah. quincy jones yeah yeah he was a very well and and there's there were um uh I, since then i came up with uh, two or three other names who were somewhat jazz right uh oriented who i i don't know that they got their start because of uh of, anyway it's a much smaller sure, thing yeah, yeah. but it, it never hurts to be famous does it kaya yeah, doesn't um, <laughs> and even better than being famous is being successful yeah um and so in terms of best of times worst of times yeah using and and I still feel using social media is hit and miss but for the people watching this uh this podcast slash YouTube video um please comment on any experience you've had in which somebody found you online yeah because I would love I love those stories in fact anybody who has a truly unusual story about how they connected on a short film on on a video game on anything doesn't matter how big or small it is you know yeah. i i would love you know to flood the comments with interesting personal stories uh of it yeah that's absolutely i mean yeah times are changing and, and everything changes around it and uh and uh i mean it's crazy because i i, I think about it too like I, i've been in la i moved in 2011 and or 2010 and it's just like I've already been a decade plus and it's like everything changed. I remember when I started working at Disney, we were creating Netflix was just kind of becoming a mm -hmm. thing. We were creating art for Netflix and there was no Disney uh, plus, no Disney movies anywhere. There was no streamings or anything. It's just it's an, everything was just, I mean, I was working in home entertainment. We we're working in on Blu-ray cases and everything, which I still buy. I, still, <laughs> I have my 4K yeah. collection. I, oh yeah, I have my Dolby Good Atmos. I'm a physical guy, even though <laughs> I still buy the CDs. You know, CDs. I'm the, I'm the. I think soundtrack. Honestly, soundtrack fans are keeping CDs afloat because from La La Land and Entrada and Varez. You know, that's a good point. You're absolutely, you're absolutely right. I, I don't know how many uh, new albums you know from pop music are being sold on on CDs. That what the sales are, but I, I did read that they are making a little bit of a comeback because you know vinyl was never kind of what it did boom boom back. But um, um, but I think we've covered so many uh topics i don't want to drag this on too long for people who are listening but i do want to before we wrap up i i would love to just talk to you because it's been a while since we've talked and i want to just put, maybe put the focus back on you you know you you have done some uh some amazing work recently and you mentioned your work on video games that yeah, you know, you're working with some awesome composers you know you know cody who's an awesome you know composer you've co-composed with and you did dance of death with jules scott the walking dead uh, last mile which was an interactive kind of live thing and then quantor with cody and uh, and you had your single album uh, last <clears> year, uh, Lume, uh, which was another. I think it was just so you and your voice and oh, you. Thank got you, Loom. Oh, sorry, so, Loom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that I've done. In 2017, I put out my first solo album, yeah. and I just was pining to do something new. So I did an album called Projector. Uh, a lot of it was because I'd started working with Peter Gregson, the British uh, cellist, and um, film composer um he's on deutsche gramophone and he said jeff you should just be doing albums so we did you know he, he he features prominently on that album then i did my COVID album not to be a cliche but i did my all electronic album uh called vapor and that was every morning waking up and doing something on my modular uh and then that becoming something there's a couple of vocals on that and then just uh, a few months ago, I released my third album called Loom, which is an electronic album, but features a full orchestra. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I'd never gotten a chance to really do something that was truly electronic, but also super emotional. And, you know, it's sort of like projector is light, vapor is dark, and loom is light again, although, well, it means light, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a picture of the sun on the cover. So, you know, spoiler. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to do something uh, super emotional that that stepped outside of of the of the storytelling. Although apparently I, you know, 
storytelling is storytelling. I'm a musical storyteller. Yeah. Everything I do has some aspect of everything I've been doing for 30 years, almost 30 years. Um, and it, 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 you know, at one level, music is music. You know, whether you're scoring a video game, which has its own set of sort of compositional criterion, scoring a film with an orchestra, scoring, you know, a television series with an orchestra, scoring something purely electronically, making music is making music. It is still, Kaya, it is still the most wonderful, mysterious, yeah. uh, elusive, um, amazing thing I do. It, it never, it, you know, I, I, everything I do teaches me something about myself and something that I could do better. You know, everything is, it just, that part never changes. You know, that beginner's yeah. mind that wrote that first book, it's still here. Yeah. Just, I just can't justify advertising it anymore. <laughs> um, and, you know, you asked about it in, in, in the new edition of the book, and I apologize that I have to look it up. But, you know, one of the things about the book is that it it's full of interviews. And I really yeah. felt that it was super important to interview some of the newer voices um, uh, in here. So because, you know, I, I do I did get John Williams to do an interview, which, frankly, oh, wow. I mean, how often does he um, does he do that? Right. Yeah, really. Um, uh, but I have John Williams and James Newton Howard and Hans Zimmer. And yeah. I have a great interview with Basil Polydorus. Um, you know, from, in, from, from the, he passed away not long after the first edition, he right. was another person who was my mentor, yeah, you know, was, before yeah. anybody, I, I was, I orchestrated for him when I was in college, when I was like wow. 19 and I'm working on, you know, Lonesome Dove and, uh, yeah. Conan the Barbarian. Um, but you know, I got Ludwig Göransson in the new one. I got Sarah Schachner. I got yeah. Wilbur Roger, who a lot of people, uh, don't know. I got uh, Joe Trapanese uh, in in the book. Um, Jack Wall, who's a veteran. He's the first person I've ever recorded an orchestra I love, for video game. I love game. Jack. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there, you know, there's some great interviews with. By the way, you know Ludwig. Um, uh, I reached out to him. We'd only met very briefly, but he was happy to do it. Turns out that he's a young heavy metal guitar player in Sweden yeah. um, and just loved playing heavy metal. And somebody gave him a copy of my book. And, wow. he, read it, and he got on a plane to the, and went to USC and took the film music course. And while at USC, who did he meet? Brian Coogler and uh, uh, Donald Glover. Donald Glover, they were, yeah. They were college friends. And between the two of them, that's 99% of his career. Yeah, it's it is yeah you and we they're taking it back to the beginning of just coming with that attitude, uh, being just a good human being and and being a collaborator and a friend and we talked about being friends outside and and yeah you uh, almost every success story it's tied to like oh we met in college you know we met this and then you look at all the the great collaborations <clears throat> it's usually starts you know from and it just goes back to that human journey you know you, you're on a journey with somebody else and yeah it's it's fun to continue that journey if you like each other and you get along and it's uh you know people don't want to work absolutely you know, well, people don't you know, work with what, assholes so <laughs> <laughs> actually some people are willing to do that all the time you know <laughs> i think at the core of every great relationship whether it's with a spouse a director a friend anybody comes down to one thing and that's trust yeah Trust. You know, we live in a world in which not everybody is worthy of our trust. Right. Not everybody is capable of being worthy of our trust. When we meet people that we can feel uh, that we can trust, to be able to speak our minds, act, behave, and say the things we want, that's very special. That's yeah. been special from day one. But when you acknowledge it and that you don't differentiate between the value of trust in a personal relationship or a professional relationship. We trust our doctors, we trust our therapists, you know, we trust our car mechanics. Yeah. We, you know, everything we do is based on trust. You have an electrician come over and they fuck up your, 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 your wiring. Well, I don't trust that person anymore. I'm <laughs> gonna find somebody new. Oh, 
I have this electrician who I've been using. They're great. You should try them out. Yeah, yeah. You know, what about? when you ask somebody for a suggestion, oh, yeah, you know, you, oh, you need a dermatologist? I know a derm Whatever it is, everything we do come at, at some point either begins or ends with the fact that, yeah, we trust them. And as a composer, that level, that bond that you build over trust of I'm listening to you. I've heard what you've said. Let me try it again. Let me do something a little different. I don't think we've found our beat yet. Let's do this. And when you, if you don't like it, be honest with me. And if I think you're, yeah. you're taking this idea in the wrong direction, let's talk it over. That's trust. And, you know, we build it with the people who hire us. We also build it with the people we hire. You know, there's a reason that we as composers work with the same musicians over and over and over again, because you build a nonverbal level of communication based on, yeah. Short I, yeah. I know you know what to do. Right. And I absolutely love that. I really do. And I think it's at the heart of my whole life is I've been burned. I think it comes up in the book occasionally. Yeah. You know, I've learned a little bit about the, about the world and it 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 it's like the entertainment business kaya is just this microcosm of the world at large it's a yeah. little weirder <laughs> um it, it it's a little more cartoonish in that you know there are heroes and villains and you can't always tell them apart um <laughs> by the way is a very important part of storytelling right if yes. you know protagonist uh, antagonist yeah good guy not so good bad guy not so bad um <laughs> We, we, we learn to navigate a world we were not, we did not create. That is, that is life. That is our careers. We navigate a world we did not create. We can create our own world within it, but that does require trust and savvy and learning from our mistakes and the willingness to make those mistakes, yeah. which I think never gets enough, uh, uh, credit for i've never met anybody whose career didn't come from mistakes I mean, you have to that's how you learn you i don't know it, it, it just popped on my instagram uh matt damon talking about writing goodwill hunting with yeah. ben affleck and did you see that little clip it was what a brilliant thing i haven't ben seen the clip affleck. yet i saw the video on youtube i was going to watch it later they're sitting out talking well, about their career it's five yeah. seconds long ben affleck uh uh um matt damon says Ben Affleck said the most important thing anybody said to him in his entire life. He said, judge me for the goodness of my good ideas, not the badness of my bad ideas. Right. Wow. And you yeah. know what? Absolutely. I've always said, and I say it in the book, that the only difference maybe between a good composer and a mediocre composer is that a good composer knows when they've written crap. Yeah. And they throw it out. Nobody ever hears it. You know? And I've worked, I've painted myself into a corner. All of us have. Yeah. You score a scene and you think, oh my God, this is pearls of genius coming from my fingertips. I can't wait to play this for the director. Yeah. Go to sleep, come back the next morning. What drug was I on? <laughs> well, the drug you were on is, is objectivity. Yeah. I think learning objectivity for your own output. You know, we all love our children. We all love our pets. We shouldn't love the music we write, right. the minute you, you get uh, attached to it. Attachment is a bad thing in, in, in my mind. You know, when you, when you form a detachment to your own art, then you can look at it from other perspectives and you go, you know what? What a great little lilting tune, but just isn't serving the scene or the yeah. character or the director's intent. Let me see what else I can do. So, you know, not to wax too philosophical, but learning from our mistakes, building those bonds, yeah. learning to have the objectivity to know when you need to try again or try harder or delete that, you know, that oboe part that just comes in at the wrong place, no matter how heart meltingly <laughs> beautiful it is. Yeah. And then I think you, you have a, then you have a shot yeah. learning to, to, to let go of attachment, you know, it's, it's, what you learn when you study Buddhism and Hinduism, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Don't be attached, you know, let go of attachment. 
Well, how do you let go of attachment from the world, from the people you love? Fact yeah. is, is, you do it through, through objectivity. Wow. I mean, that's well. That's so well put. Uh, I mean, I, I think we've covered so much here to, tonight, and and your book has uh, obviously been such a wonderful resource. So thank you for taking thank the time you. to 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 refresh it for for twenty twenty three and. Yeah, I, I urge everyone to go check it out. Uh, and it's such a wonderful resource. And and Jeff Thank has you. always Jeff has always been just, I mean, I can't wait to get back to LA so we can have that scotch night and we're just going to sit and just, you know, t- we'll wax philosophical off camera. You for know, hours. scotch <laughs> night has been waiting A for you, yeah. B for you to stay uh, light a little later. Yeah. And it's it, we're getting really close. So I'll see you in a couple of months. Absolutely.